killing mosquitoes with mosquitoes, mosquito. It's a little bit of a play on words. You'll understand at one point in the talk. But this is kind of my journey from being someone who had never touched any hardware, never lit, written a line of C. I mean, I don't know, maybe I had. <laughs> but the, probably never written a line of C to you know, finding a cool way to hardware hack and stop the mosquitoes in my backyard. So a little bit about me. I'm a software guy, mostly worked in backend and infrastructure. Uh, I dislike mosquitoes. Uh, I like buying stuff on Amazon. And when I find a project that pushes me out of my comfort zone that also allows me to buy stuff on Amazon, I'm usually a pretty happy camper. But I want to harp on this a little bit, which is the point of this talk is to kind of not, it's, it's to teach you a little bit, but it's also to encourage you that if there are things that you see that you wonder, I wonder if I could do that, it's probably not that hard to make that little jump, um, especially or even in areas where you have absolutely no experience at all. So that's the lens I want you to look at this talk. I also want to quickly ask, how many people here have, like, in any minor way at all, used the ESP32 or an Arduino? Great, cool. Um, and let's get going. So this is May of 2023. And I was a very unhappy camper. I had just moved to this house in my backyard. My neighbor must have a marsh or something because we were just getting completely lit up by mosquitoes. There's very little I could do. So like any 30-some person, I went on wire cutter, and they recommended this really sweet thermocell smart mosquito repellent system. Looked really cool. Now, it's $800, but read what cool stuff it does. The app provides total control of the system, including turning the repellers on and off, putting them on a schedule, checking the amount of repellent re remaining, and there's even colorful lights on it. But it's $800. So I got the mid option, which is the basically all the mosquito repelling, but none of the fun or smartness. And I got three of them or two of them or whatever, and I set them up in my backyard that summer, and it was terrible. It was annoying. I'd remember to turn it on and off. <laughs> it on, but when you have a yard and you have two or three of them, it is pretty annoying. You're like, you go over and you have to hold it down to turn it on. Um, I had to remember to keep them charged, so these things have batteries in them. Uh, you don't get a notification when fluid runs out, so it just goes, it just will keep running, even though there's no fluid, and it won't even change colors or anything. Super annoying. Impossible to automate, so you have to think about it. You can't just be like, oh, it's been on for three hours, maybe it should just turn off because we're never outside that long. Or like, you know, I want to, I want to try to detect when I'm outside and turn on. Um, and I knew I didn't have the upgrade pick. I, it just wore at me. I didn't have the cool option. So in May of 2024 came around, I got bit by my first mosquito. I was like, you know what? This is the year. This is the year I go big. And wow, look at this system. You, you, you hardwire them all together. They look real nice. There's this app. Now it's $800, but you know maybe I can convince the wife to let me do it. So I go on the website to buy it, and they're out of stock. And now they weren't just out of stock in, you know, April. They were out of stock in May. They were out of stock in June. They, they were out of stock the whole beginning of the summer. And the reviews are like, this is ridiculous. You can't get refills. You can't buy the system if there's no fluid. And people are like, this app sucks. There's tech trouble. It doesn't even connect to 5G Wi-Fi. I'm thinking like, ah, OK, you're right. What if, you know, and, and the, the, so there's all these expensive Issues with the expensive version. Obviously, it's expensive. Each repeller is 250 bucks. Um, and every repeller needs to be wired back to the hub, hardwired. So for me, that's a pain because I have like a hardscape backyard. Like, how do I get stuff to it? I can't integrate with any of my own smart home automation. So I'm not going to get too in the weeds of other smart home automation si systems, but I use Home Assistant for everything. Very fancy uh, way of being able to automate anything. It's a little bit convoluted. We'll do another talk about that someday. But I can only use this app, and it's probably super janky based on the reviews. And it's out of stock anyway, so I can't even get it. Even though it sucks, I still can't even get it. So I start to do a little thinking. I look at the cheap version. You know, it, heat, heat, you know, I'm measuring the temperature. They actually removed this, right? But it's like, theoretically, these are the same thing. And I began to wonder. Oh, and, and just for those who are interested, because some people are, 
this is the way it works. You get these little pods, you drop them in and you put the top on, and it has this stuff called olethrin, which is a synthetic version of the chrysanthemum flowers. And I found, the closest thing I could find that you could buy is this stuff here, promethrin, that you use to treat clothes. And one guy on there said, it works great to refill my thermocell. This is not advice. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I thought, you know how Joe Luttrell comes and he has satellites? I got something not quite as cool. But here is, uh, just so you can see what we're working with here. So this is a thermocell. You can open it. You can look at it and see if you can think of how you would open it. Um, you guys can pass this around. Um, and I'll also pass around while I'm passing stuff around. This is just an ESP32 for those who aren't familiar. This is a very small ESP32. Um, you can pass that around. So, I thought, what if I could make the ultimate version? <laughs> I'm thinking I could make these for 40 bucks. These, these things are 30 bucks on Amazon at the beginning of the year. They're 50 bucks now, so I hate to burst your bubble. ESP32 is like five bucks. You can even get them cheaper, but the ones I like to buy are five bucks. The one in that bag are five bucks. I'd be able to automate it super easily with Home Assistant, theoretically. I could turn on when I walk outside. I could have it send me notifications when fluid is low. I could have it send me a notification if it's been on for more than three hours. Because by the way, the fluid packets are kind of expensive. So if you accidentally, this is what their incentive is, is to make your repeller run as long as possible and burn down all your fluids so you have to buy more. That's how they get, it's like the razor blade model. I could do it on my phone with HomeKit. Wouldn't that be neat? No requirement for hardwired hub. As long as I have them plugged in, theoretically I could put them anywhere. So I could have one on my front porch, two or three in my backyard. If I had a roof deck, I could put one there, but I don't. Maybe I could even connect it to 5G Wi-Fi. That'd be kind of cool. And of course, these are in stock. I could just get them. Very cool. So for those who remember my series of talks about the streets being too fast, those who were around back then, back then, 2023, I still watchable on YouTube. <clears throat> you can watch my obsessive tendencies in the past as well. But I bought one of these thinking I could use it for that project, but it was sitting in that drawer. We all have that drawer of things. And I thought, well, I'll get this thing out and I'll see if I can glue it to a, glue it to a thermocell. So quickly take you a step back. What is an ESP32? For those who aren't familiar. So an ESP32 uh, is made by a company called Espressive. Uh, is that how you say it? Does anybody know? Yeah, sounds close enough. It has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in. It's got a tiny amount of memory tiny amount of RAM. Um, it's got a really small like, CPU, which is way overpowered for anything anybody actually uses these for. This one I had bought back then actually had a dual core in case you really were trying to do some <laughs> nut stuff. And it's a microcontroller. So what is a microcontroller? Well, the difference between a microcontroller and a Raspberry Pi, as far as I can tell, is a Raspberry Pi is designed as like a full featured computer. It might have a similar CPU, it might have RAM, it's gonna have like a disk of some type, flash or whatever, but a Raspberry Pi is gonna also have like USB ports, it's gonna have display, like a, dis like a display driver of some type, it's gonna have the ability to run Linux, and that is a lot more hardware. This thing just runs C code. So you write C code, it runs it. You can also write it with MicroPython, which I think just compiles the C code, is that basically how it works? No? Oh, bytecode, there you go. Yeah, so this is basically running bytecode, whatever it is. So that's what an ESP32 is. I'm gonna run through it really quickly. So when you buy an ESP32, you're actually buying a development board. And what Espressive sells is this thing, which has you know specs for how you connect it to antennas and how you connect it to different um, pieces to make it work. But it's just this chip with all these different connectors. And when you get one, what you're getting is a development board. So you can jam it in a breadboard. This is the small one that I like. This is the one I originally bought. It's obviously a lot bigger. You can jam it in a breadboard. Breadboards are nice because they have like little metal strips underneath so you can connect things around super easy without having to solder. But when you're buying one of these, you're buying a development board that has everything nice and spread out. If you ever build something for real, for real, you'd probably just buy this and a custom you know, PCB around it. So anyway, an ESP32, generally has a lot going on, a lot of pins. And I think I was scared by the pins originally. What are all these pins? I want a USB port, you know, or like an HDMI port. 
But these pins are actually super straightforward. There's GPIO pins. I don't know why they call them GIOP pins on here. But you can basically set this pin to be high or low, and you can read high and low. High and low being 3.3 volts or 0 volts. So that's what you can do on every single one of these GIOP or GPIO ports. Um, these are kind of your bread and butter. You can turn on an LED. If a button gets pressed, you can sense it. There's these ADCs, so analog digital conversion. So you can read analog signals, which is kind of like a range of voltage values. So you think like audio signals, like you can detect light, temperature sensors can all be sent through these ADCs. You can note that, why is it shaking? The ADC and the GPIOs are shared. So they, they, the pin itself would be pin three, but it has both of these capabilities on it. There's DAX, which is reverse, so you can actually like generate. So it's not like a GPIO where it's actually you can read in, write on a pin. Um, you can only read on the ADCs, and you can send out stuff on the DACs. There's touch sensors that literally you can just touch them, and it'll detect that you touch them, or you can connect a wire to it. There's a bunch more. Some of them are like, so you can hook up SD card modules. They try to just have enough pins on there that you can do most of the things you'd want to do, including like hooking up GPS or like, for example, you could hook up a Bluetooth module if you had an Arduino. Arduinos don't have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built into them, basically. ESP32s have that built in. And another important thing to mention about these is they're designed to be super, super low power consumption. So you can just take one of these it theoretically run it on a battery for a week or something. They're not really like the, the lowest sipping of juice, but they, they can run on a battery, um, especially if you deep sleep and whatever. We'll get to that later. So how would this actually look? I talked about C. You should never write C. We have ChatGPT now. Uh, the gist of it is it's kind of hard to read, I guess, probably. But this is an example of Arduino IDE. This is. If you're a noob like me, use Arduino IDE. You can, there's a setup function and a loop function. Setup runs first, and then loop just keeps going. So this is an example of where you're setting the LED pin to output, the status pin to input. You're starting a serial connection. So you, in Arduino IDE, you can just see any print statements where you can send um, anything back on the serial connection. Um, and then you're just seeing the most basic version, which is reading an analog value or writing an analog value. So like turning an LED on or off or detecting whether a button has been pressed. So Arduino IDE is super cool. You can include libraries like Wi-Fi, HTTP, PubSub. And these are where you get into the real juice of being able to do fun stuff. So I ran a couple quick tests on that Arduino I had. I tried connecting it to my Wi-Fi. That works super easy. It says connected. And then I did like basically an HTTP git on example.com. That worked. And then here's me trying to test to the MQTT server in my house. A quick note on MQTT. When you're communicating with Home Assistant, you can communicate with Home Assistant, which is kind of your, your brain of your smart home, via HTTP. Totally possible. But MQTT or any type of queuing system is sweet because your devices can always connect back and check for messages. So if they're, they happen to be missing a Wi-Fi signal at some point in time or whatever, or they're down because these things always crash, then they can, get the wi they can go back and see if there's any messages for them. Like, oh, ah, shit, I was supposed to turn off 20 minutes ago. I'll turn off now. At least it'll turn off, you know what I mean? So that's the gist. So I'm like, cool. I know how an ESP32 works, and I have this device. OK, so everybody kind of got to see it. How would you open this? Does anybody know? No, no, this, this opens like this. How would you get inside of it? Oh, sorry, I should have made that more clear. How would you get inside of this? There's no screws, right? So I, I figured, oh, what would you do? What would you do? I mean, people yell some stuff. Well, I thought angle grinder, because... <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what I was doing a lot of. So I took the angle grinder, and I and I got some pliers, and I started zipping this thing open. And then I look in, and there's clearly screws in there. And I realized underneath that there, there's these little pads, and oh, little screw holes. Ah, damn. Well, this one's that one will sit in the garage or, or the trash can. So OK, cool. So I go to do the screws, 
It's a triangle screwdriver. I don't open Happy Meal toys for a living. I don't have a way to open this. So I screwed those out. <laughs> so this thing's completely shut. I figured I already ruined the side of it. And I got it open. And this is what's inside. It's pretty neat looking, actually. You got a nice little big board here. Um, really importantly, look at this, 3.8 volts. So that's within the voltage range of the ESP32. Right off the jump, I'm in the money. Right? We're working on the same voltage. I'm not an electrical engineer. I can't explain voltage. I know when they're the same. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, this here, these little pins at the top, if you were looking at it, this top has the heater in it. And that's this little thing here. The, I got this one open. Uh, there's little pop, things you could pop off. Much easier. But this one, this is the heater. So these three pins connect to the little pads underneath, and it gets this hot. And then that, this little wick gets hot, and it releases the substance, and it works great. It keeps the mosquitoes away. But I'm looking at this, and I think what I need is a way to switch on the device. Right? I need to be able to use my knowledge of the ESP32 to make this device turn on. I need to know whether it's on or off. Right? Maybe the way I switch it on could let me know if it's on or off, but I need to know whether it's on or off. And I need to get power to my ESP32. Or I need to power this device from the ESP32. Both are totally options. Um, but this is what I need to be able to do. This is my new mission. So like, what am I looking at here, right? Some of you might look at this, you might recognize some of these components. I have no idea. So who did I ask? You got a friend? ChatGPT. Can you help me identify these components? So it did. It walked me through them. So I could see these are resistors. All these red ones here are resistors, which, you know, limit or regulate the flow of electrical current. I, yeah, I still, they're still a little hard for me to grasp in some ways, but there's a lot of them on there, and I think that's good. You see they're all, <laughs> you see they're all labeled with the letter R. Yes, they are. That's how ChatGPT looks so smart. Uh, capacitors, so these I can get a little more. They store and release energy, um, making sure there's like stable power supply. Um, diodes, you know what these are? LEDs, the, they show you, and there's actually, I didn't label these ones down there, but they basically are the light emitters. This is a transistor, right? Um, you can basically, you have one terminal in the middle that if you give signal, it'll control the connection between the other two terminals. So this is a really powerful concept I'll talk about later because it was really important for me to be able to get this working. Um, and then these are integrated circuits. So these, as far as I'm concerned, they're the black box. Everything else on here you can understand kind of. Just like, oh yeah, this is a resistor. I could probably sit there with the multimeter and tell you exactly what type of resistor it is. These, no idea, right? We could sit there probably and try to figure it out, but these are black boxes. They could be controlling anything from the charging to the heating, could be really complicated, I don't know. They, they seem to remove the label of what it actually is. Um, and then there's other stuff, there's test pads, um, which I you know, obviously play around with a little bit, I'll talk about that in a minute. There's switches, this is a switch right in the middle that turns it on and off, and then there's this power connector, and a power connector on the top to get to the top thing. So that's it, that's what the board is. Right? That's what we're working with here. We need to figure out how to turn this thing on. So theoretically, I could go through and reverse engineer the board, but I'd, I don't have time for that. And I don't have the tools either, honestly. I just needed a way to turn it on, to know if it's on, and power my USB 32. Great. So I actually got really lucky with the turning it on. So I asked ChatGPT, this is a switch. And it basically was like, maybe try just bridging the connection. So I just took a wire and stuck it on both sides, turned on. Hold it on there for three seconds and it turns it off. Okay, so I've done that. That was kind of the easy part, it turns out. But determining whether it was on actually turned out to be harder than you'd think. I don't know why this was hard for me, but I bought the multimeter. Okay, yeah, look at me go. And, you know, there's these oscilloscopes, oscilloscopes, how do you say this? This would have been sweet to have, but I was not paying, even the cheap ones, or like a couple hundred bucks or whatever. <laughs> so I did, yeah. It, it, you can actually use an ESP32 as an oscilloscope. How do you say it? Oscilloscope? oscilloscope? Oscilloscope. You can actually do that. And I did. 
And it was pretty cool, because think about it. They have these ADCs on them, right? They're not as sensitive as an expensive oscilloscope, but they work. <laughs> they can show me a signal. So what did I do? I went pad by pad, and I looked at, turn it on, it does this on this one, and then it does that when it's off. Or this is another example, this one when it's high, it's at four volts when it's off, and when it's on, it drops down. And this actually gets higher and higher and higher as the, the, uh, the, the temperature gets higher on the, uh, the, the heating element. So I went through and tested every single one. The majority of them were just always four volts. I didn't really understand this. Um, but a few of them, so this one and the last one, were both my candidates. So I can see a difference in the pattern when it is on versus when it is off. But I want to call out that this has been extremely confusing for me, because some of this that will work on battery power, you plug it in, it still works. But then the device gets fully charged, it doesn't work anymore. So there's a lot of subtleties to this. Luckily, there's a lot of these little pads to work with. And so I was able to eventually find one that was pretty consistent. But still, I, I might try to find a better one in the future. OK, so cool. I could see that it's on. I could turn off by bridging two pads. We're really in the money here, right? Um, so now how do I power the SP32? Well, I asked ChatGPT again. And it's like, I have a small device that runs off a 3.7 volt battery. Can I just put my ESP32 on the same battery? I don't know if this is safe. But yeah, that's what it said I can do. Does anybody know? Is that safe? Is the question. Yeah, there we go. So that's what I did. And I just soldered, basically, I'll get to that in a second, but basically hook them both to the same battery. Boom, we're done. Um, cool, now it's time. We know that we have the capabilities. We know of the board. We know to control the board carefully. How can we make this happen automatically? So this is where the fun part, the C, comes in. So, but also, something troubling happened. I realized at this point I was going to give a talk, because I'm like, this is fun content. I want to give a talk. I looked up. Oh, no. There is a difference between these two. One is 20 feet, and mine is only 10 feet. This is unacceptable. It, it made me a little sad. But I went on Thermosel's website. I hunted around, and it turns out they do have a different model that does a 20-foot zone. But now I'm back to square zero, right? Because I don't know what's going to happen when I get this new one. But it'll at least have a 20-foot zone. So I returned all the ones that I bought to, <laughs> to Kohl's. <laughs> I just clicked no longer needed, and I put A in the box. And they haven't gotten mad at me yet. But the, I returned them all. Boom, and look at this. There was actually a sale, 30 bucks for these things. Um, and I bought three. Best seller, only a 4.1, but we're going to fix that, right? <laughs> um, and I open it up, and if you remember looking at this, there's a battery in here, a board in here, and there's not much room. That's why I bought the really small ESP32s. This thing is cavernous inside. There is room to fit some. A lot of stuff in here. And the board, I'll show you the board. The board is complete, much cleaner. Look at this up here. It's showing me where the ground is. Like, it's, it's off to the races. Look how clean all these resistors are versus this one. It's like they really had a chance at V2 here. This is actually a real button you can press. This one you, you couldn't press. Where's the smiley face? Oh, yeah, I see that, yeah. So we have a new board, and it turns out that um, I didn't have trouble. It was the same thing connecting, and I did find the pa same pads. Actually, the oscilloscope results are from the new one, actually. Um, and it's good. So great. Let's get ready to solder. Now, I suck at soldering. Is anybody else good at soldering? Yeah, OK, we got a couple good solders. I'm much better now, but <laughs> not always. And I also needed some gear. It was time to go on Amazon. So I got these triangle screws. They're junk now. Does anybody want them? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, and I forgot to tell you, the, the new one is just regular screws. It's just, it's just totally fine. Uh, this one, uh, I, got, I got myself a bunch of these ESP32s. This is the first one I bought, loved it, went straight to the source, got them for five bucks. Got myself a soldering station, wish I bought a better one. 
bought a whole bunch of random junk in electronics kit, which turned out to be most of what I needed. But they were all like stranded copper wire, so I got these solid core wire kits with a pre tin very nice. Also, the solder that came with this was like the environmentally friendly stuff. Don't do that. It, did, it was terrible. This stuff is the bomb. It's got lead in it. <laughs> There's a lot of smoke. You breathe it in. You're like, good thing my brain's already developed. But. <laughs> so I got all my gear. It's time to get going. This is my new SP30. I just want to show you real quick. Not nearly as many pins, right? Um, but look at this. There's this cool battery connector on the back. And this actually allows you that if I hook this up to the battery, if I charge the ESP32, it'll actually charge the battery. And it has, and it has management of how it um, decharges or whatever. Very cool little feature that I ended up using. Um, so how are we going to wire this up? We're just going to walk through it step by step. First thing, we're going to need power. So I just go off the ground in this B+, which turned out to always be 4 volts. Straight to these battery terminals, done. Now the ESP32 turns on as long as there's charge in the battery of the thermocell. Then, this is the easy thing, I had this pad here, I just hooked it to one of the ADC ports. Okay, so that's done. Should be able to read it, right? Should be able to read the variation in values. Then, we talked about this, I need to bridge this. So this is actually, I kept yelling at ChatGPT, I'm like, I don't want to use another part. I want to do it with just the, just the ESP32. I think it's impossible. You need a transistor, which we talked about before. So what they basically recommended is you basically, from the device, from one side of the device to the other, is the outside pins of the transistor. That middle pin, when it gets signal, it'll connect the other two, basically. So what you do, is you have this one wire going to the middle pin of the transistor. When it sends a high, three volts, it'll connect the other two. So they look like this, for those who haven't done these before. Um, one side is flat, the other side is rounded. And theoretically, this should work, but I haven't written any code yet. How hard do you think that's going to be? Maybe. I don't, we'll see. So of course, I get, oh, OK, I guess I'm going to talk about soldering at first. So yeah. Which, sorry, which, which thing? A while back you showed this. The waveforms? The oscilloscope. The oscilloscope? When it, when basically, let me talk about this real fast. So I can explain this a little more. So this is on this y axis is the voltage. No, no, I understand that. That's a display that came with you. No, this is, so this is a GitHub repository that I found that you, push onto another ESP32, and you use the ADCs from it to read from another device. So it's. What are you displaying that on? Oh, this is just on a web browser. It actually has a little web server that runs on the ESP32. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Which, which, which information? Any, any of the functions where you're displaying things. That's just through a, uh, LEDs. Which, what are you talking about? What am I displaying? I think I understand that. How do you do user interface for this type of stuff? For the Arduino? Well, right now I'm just connecting it per spec, right? Like, I haven't gotten to any displaying. I'll get to that in one second. So I've connected it all. Now, like, the process, for those who have not done this, it's pretty straightforward. I bought all these nice little wires. I cut a bunch of them. I connect the transistor with a bunch of solder, and then I electric tape it. The what? More solder equals better. I pre-tin these things. I definitely use a lot of solder because, OK, if you've ever been trying to get the little wire on the little pad and the wire is moving, I must be missing something because it's like. I think that's on a bad solder. OK. All right, fair enough. So this is what it looks like when I jam it all in. I guess I missed a picture here. But the gist of it is, then I just kind of jam it all in there. Now, notice I highlight this little thing here. This is an antenna that sticks on the SP32. And the reason I bring this up, oh, I forgot that I actually have, uh, oh, no, I'll, I'll show you guys that at the end. If 
I leave the antenna in ESP32 inside the body of this thermocell, it will not connect. It's too thick. It's not designed for radio waves. But I came up with a little hack. I guess I can pass this other one around I have. This is a functioning one. This one's actually currently running on battery power. And if it were connected to my Wi-Fi, it would actually be working. Um, there's nothing in it. But I'm going to take this top off. I'm going to take the bottom off. And you can, I'm going to take this little button off. And you can pass it on. This is what it looked like. But the gist of it is what I was able to do is because there's this hole at the bottom, I kind of jammed the antenna down in and out the bottom, and it worked fine. It's kind of sketchy. I don't know if it's waterproof, but that, that's how I had to deal with the antenna. As long as it's mosquito proof. So, and then this is my first soldering attempt. <laughs> yeah. This was bad. <laughs> I do want to drive home the amount of chat GPT I used for all of this. Right? You don't have to read this, but like every step along the way, if you have a question or I had a question, I was able to get through it. It was fine. Like some of the questions are it just felt so dumb. But it's so nice to have dumb questions and have a a very patient friend. So every talk's an AI talk now in my mind, but so then I got here. I used all this knowledge I'd built up, and I said, OK, this is the system. I got this thermostat board, this ESP32 board. Can you write me the ESP32 code? Here's every pin. Let's you know, just jam it all in there. Can you write me the code? And finally, it'll wirelessly interface with MQTT. The major fun thing about MQTT, I'll quickly say, is if you give an MQT, it, if you have an MQTT server in your house and a device knows about it, it can send data to that server, or to that MQTT server, and when your home assistant at home reads that data, it'll automatically add the device. So you don't have to manually go add a device. Just by simply pointing these thermocells as I create them at my MQTT server, it'll just magically pick it up and start working. So it's a super nice feature. That's why I use MQTT. But OK, and the whole thing is that the MQTT server is called Mosquito. So that's kind of the whole like, reason I made the talk that it's not that good of a joke, but I thought it was clever at the time. Um, I'm going to quickly walk through the code, very quickly. I'm not trying to show everybody what, but this is basically what it does. On that setup function, it connects to Wi-Fi. I create a unique ID for it using the MAC address. I initialize those MQTT topics, and I connect to MQTT. And I set up a callback, so when messages come in, they go to the callback. There, you publish this discovery message I was just talking about. This discovery message is what goes to Home Assistant and registers the device. Um, this is a status update that gets sent on a loop. It basically is just saying, if the pad value is less than 2,000, that being 2 volts, uh, the device is probably on. If it's higher, then it's off. That was kind of how I determined it. And that's getting sent as an MQTT event to Home Assistant. And here's that callback. So when we get a message from, MQ, from Home Assistant, if the message is on, we write out on that one pin that's connected to the transistor, we wait a minute, and then we turn it off. So we're basically doing a touch, like you're touching the button. Same thing for off, but we do a delay, four, th four second delay. And that should turn it off. Now, of course, this is complicated, because if the device is already on, or the device is already off, and we send the off command, it'll actually turn the device on. Um, because of the fact that we're sending the 4,000 or the 4,000 millisecond command, that'll still register as on. So this is a little bit complicated. You have to kind of code around it. Um, and this, this is like an interim <laughs> version. And it kind of worked, right? Like this is the interim version with the old board when I was just goofing off. But I wrote all that code, and I did get it working. And I was like, this is kind of cool, but like, Am I doing, am I like doing too much here? Because it felt like I was doing too much. And so I started Googling around, and lo and behold, does anybody, anybody want to say what I found? Anybody got a guess? What? So people don't know what this is? People can't guess? Anybody know this? So you define your microcontroller behavior in YAML. Uh, once you set it up, 
you can have OTA updates. So you can just, if I want to change the, the, the threshold by which it's on or off, I just change it in the YAML and push it, and just click, click send. Auto, does all that auto integrating I slaved over, like I worked hard to get that auto integration to Home Assistant working. Yeah. Um, I also just a note that like I could totally be, again, I could be totally using the API, but I'm using HTTP. And this is just a lesson that, like I learned this lesson like a thousand times in my life. It's like, don't do things by hand, right? Like if, if there are things people have written, hundreds of people have written the same thing, there's probably a whole community. This is a huge project. This is a huge project. Everybody uses ESP Home, because look how simple it is. So this, you set this MQTT information, this is my server, don't hack it please. <laughs> uh, uh, this is, you know, Wi-Fi, right? And this goes in like a common.yaml file, so all your little, um, your little, uh, you, you could, I have like temperature sensors, all this stuff, they can all work on this common file. And then what I'm actually creating for my individual thermocells, uh, I define an output, which is just a pin, GPIO2, and then this is a switch. So I'm saying, hey, when it turns back on, if, because the ESP32 is crash occasionally, just, just don't do anything when it reboots. Leave it at the state it was at, like the, the external device is at, and we're just doing these tiny little functions here. Um, if you're just literally controlling a GPIO pin, the code would be like, three lines. But because I'm doing complicated stuff where I'm turning on, delaying, and then turning off, and then publishing the state of true, that takes these extra little lines, but it allows that expressiveness and complexity, which is pretty cool. Like you can do this, or you can do the dead simple version as well. And then for sensing it is kind of similarly easy, like we're just saying listen to this pin here. Um, and Every 500 milliseconds, check it. Not great for the battery. And I use a sliding moving average. This is just what I found to be useful. I need, this is the one thing I really got to tune. Because sometimes it's sending like every two and a half seconds, right? Based on a moving average. But sometimes I'll turn the device off. But because it's a moving average, it'll send that message right after I turned it off. It'll send a status of on to Home Assistant. And it's not a big deal, the device stays off, but it flickers in the UI, and I'm like, ah, no, no, it's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be perfect. Um, and yeah, so that's all it is. And this is saying if the voltage is higher than 0.5. This, oh, go ahead. Does ChatGPT know about ESP Home? Well, so ChatGPT knows about everything. It'll try. <laughs> ESP Home, I did have to do a lot more documentation pasting, which I recommend anyway. You should always be pasting all the relevant documentation. Like, do that extra legwork yourself, because you'll get much better results if you just paste all the documentation for the sensor page in. If it has all that, you'll get some much better, cleaner solutions. Even though ChatGPT might give you a solution, it'll feel like super lengthy. And even right now, I'm wondering, like, surely there's a way to do this in fewer lines. And I'll spend some time trying to figure that out. Um, but this works. Um, and it's sweet. Oh, and then um, this is all the configuration looks like for each thermocell. This is like my deck one. Include the common settings, include the thermocell settings, which I just showed you, and then every time I add a new thermocell, I add one of these lines. And the first time I add a thermocell, I take that ESP32 in there, plug it in, and I flash it like this. I run ESP run thermocell deck.yaml. It compiles it. I push it to this modem here. It sets up these little MQTT topics. It starts pushing values. Thermocell state off. Thermocell stay off. And then if I turn it on, it sends the logs for that. And it's got this really sweet dashboard. You can run this on, like, if you have, like, a, a NAS at home, or you can just run it on your laptop. And I'll run it, and, you know, I can just, I can, for my different thermocells or, you know, the temperature sensors I have, I can just click here, and I can edit the configuration, look at the logs. Like, if I had done this with the C code, how would I look at logs? How would I know what's going on? You'd have to go plug into it. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> or like, let's say you want to change that code. First of all, that code is brittle. I'm not going to write tests or anything. And then it's, right now I can just edit here and just over the air update it. Super convenient, super nice. Um, you can define secret. I mean, there's just some good stuff in here. Um, 
And then, of course, they magically show up in Home Assistant, which, like I said, I'm not going to go super in depth on Home Assistant, but they magically show up in Home Assistant. And then by extension, they magically show up on my phone. So I can now control my thermocells just as easily as I control the lights in my basement or whatever other common things I'm working with. So I just boop, 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 easy. I can also, because I'm on Home Assistant, I can really easily define it that if it's been on for an hour, I can just have it send me a notification. Hey, thermocell's been on for an hour. And I'm like, nah, never mind, don't worry about it. Next hour, oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like you just write really simple YAML. I haven't gotten this one working yet, but this is trying to get the history of the thermocell and I want to know if I hit 30 hours, because that's how long the fluid lasts for. The reason I haven't actually implemented this yet is I'm not sure how I'm going to deal with when I reset the fluid, how do I detect that and know to restart that timer. But that's one of the things I was noodling on today. It's, it's, it's fun. Like you, you, once you have that power in Home Assistant, of course, I'm not writing this either. Who's writing it? ChatGPT, right? It's like you can do all those things. So yeah, this is what it looks like out back now. So I got one up here, it's plugged in. What's really cool, because they're low voltage coming out of USB, you can run these wires, because it barely needs any amperage at all. I can run these wires back to somewhere safe and dry, run it all the way to the, the thermocell, and I don't really have to stress about you know, any type of like electrical hazard or whatever in the rain. I can run these the same way they're doing it for their fancy devices, but they don't have to go to a central location. So I can have one on my porch, two in my backyard, wherever it might be. So this is me now. I got them working today. But, you know, <laughs> I'm sure this will be me tomorrow. <laughs> well, like I said, I've used these devices a lot. I love these devices. If you have mosquito problems, you should use these devices. It is a pain to manage them without this smart stuff. The smart stuff is what is going to, in the future, make it so that the kids walk outside, the camera notices a kid, it turns the devices on. That is what's going to be the future. So, so how far are you towards that part? Well, like I said, talk-driven development, you know, I, I, <laughs> I had to do a lot of work to get here today. Everything's working nice and smooth. It looks nice. But like I said, these are all my next ups that some of these I was hoping to get to today but didn't get to, which is the fluid use. I think that'd be pretty cool to have a way to keep track of fluid. The flicker. It's so like I said, here, let's, let's do a live demo here. So when I, uh, we'll see if it flickers for us. So let's say I pull up my home assistant. So deck is the one you guys are passing around, but then this thermocell here, click it on. Ta -da! And if you're in my backyard, it would go Broop! And you can actually take the speaker off, but I love it. And then I can just click it again, and it turns off. Now, sometimes that will flicker on for like half a second. Oh, there it is. Yeah, and then it'll turn back off, I hope. Yeah, there you go. So it's like, it'll do this, and it like doesn't bother me that much, but I know it's just that moving window. I have to like play with it a little bit, and I know I'll get it. And I was hoping to get it before I showed up here, but you know, whatever. Um, like, yeah, like I said, automating it for when I'm outside, super cool concept. I have a camera for my front porch. It's a Nest camera, and it sends me motion events. But I need to find a way to not make it motion events for people walking by. So I have to try to use zones, and I haven't gotten there yet. But that's all in Home Assistant. Yeah, maybe. Um, safety. So I'm actually kind of scared to put this on my front porch, because that could actually set my house on fire. The back porch, whatever, it just, just but these batteries are a little scary. I'm going to let it sit for like a couple months, make sure nothing. Put it in a flower pot? ceramic, but it also needs airflow. Oh, yeah, I guess that could be pretty good. I'll just tell my wife it's so kids don't grab it or something like that. <laughs> uh, I was thinking because there's so much room in these things, I could poke a little temperature sensor out and get have it be kind of like a mini weather station, um, maybe a motion sensor in them because there's so much space and there's a lot more pins on the uh, on the. And if I'm if I'm keeping them plugged in, um, oh yeah, I didn't mention this one, but optimizing the battery. So right now I'm not doing any deep sleep. I don't need these turned on quickly. As long as they turn on the next minute after I turn them on or turn off in the next minute, that means I could deep sleep for 60 seconds. Um, 
that's pretty good. It means that, like, I, like the description says, they have five hour battery life. The ESP would probably tear them down. So you still have to charge them every couple weeks or every month at the very least. So I kind of like the model where I leave them plugged in, but it'd be kind of fun if I ever you know, really get into these and you know, make a bunch of them. Of course, I could jam some LED lights. Solar power. solar power, yeah, that's what my wife wants me to do. I'm like, no way, that's too complicated. <laughs> I could totally do that. It's probably pretty easy. You probably just straight into the micro USB, throw it up. Um, but yeah, and I might do that. But at the end, that is the end. That's that's the gist of the project. And uh, yeah. Do people want to see lasers? All right, so let's talk about lasers. So, <laughs> there has been this concept of mosquito lasers floating around. It's a proposed device, blah, blah, blah. Bill, Bill Gates, scammer, uh, came up with this idea. It got a lot of media attention in 2010, which is probably when we were all in college or whatever. But this device is still under development. I, I went on Reddit, because I was just looking for anything. And, some guys like, the real issue is vision tracking. This is on Ask Engineers. Um, like, oh, when you're in a lab, it's super easy. Um, <laughs> so I went and I bought some lasers. <laughs> and this is just to appease Ken. This box says, not a bomb. But the gist of it is that I put together one of these that has a bunch of lasers <laughs> screwed into it. I did this to keep Ken happy, so let's try it out. So actually, the, the easy thing to do, theoretically, if you're trying to set up lasers, and we're looking at the information we know from before, does anybody want to take a guess how we would integrate this into ESP Home to be able to fire off these lasers? How do, what? A tracking system. Yeah, but how would we turn the lasers on and off? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you can see, oh, it's right here. So switch, platform, GPIO, name, lasers, pin. That's all you do in ESP Home to turn on lasers. So shield your eyes, friends. <laughs> I've done the bare minimum to meet the requirement of lasers. So here's some code. We can press number one, and now the laser is going straight up. I can. Now they're all coming out. Okay, whoops. All right. We're, so they're really shitty lasers, it turns out. But I've met the requirement of having lasers in the talk. And uh, I think that's it. That's all the slides. But this afternoon, I was like, maybe I can get the lasers in. So thanks, Jay. Now the lasers are just straight up on a GPIO and then all grounded on the same ground. There you go. Well, th there's a good lesson for you all. <laughs> okay, but that's actually the end. I have definitely time for questions if people want to pot shot comments. Go ahead, Leah. How many hours start to finish including the first No more than 50. <laughs> no more than 70, I should say. <laughs> Not good. Oh, absolutely. That would have been clean. And I spent a lot of time doing this. It was more complicated than you think. I spent a lot of time on this, like more time than I should have after it was going so badly. The, I worked with ChatGPT a lot. I just don't have the knowledge of how this stuff works, but it's like one of them was always getting four volts. One of them had like voltages going up, 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 up. And then it would like plateau when I think it got all the way hot. And I forget what the other one of the pins did. And so I thought, this seems straightforward. And so I tried a couple different things with uh, the, the, the like, I, resistors and random shit that ChatGPT recommended. I couldn't get it working, but it would be clean and it would be sweet. So, but remember, they had a lot of shit on that board. You know, it's like, there, there's a lot to clone there, I presume. You know, it's not as easy as just turning on voltage. 
theoretically. You can monitor for the temperature, right? They're probably yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely monitoring for the temperature on the way back, yeah. So yeah, I, they had a really sweet sale on 3D printers at Bamboo, and I almost pulled the trigger on that, but I couldn't actually come up with. A, it's true. I'm sure all I could have just posted in the maker thing. Yeah, yeah, they they need toys. That's for sure. Yeah. That's fucking Legos are for it. But yeah, I agree. <laughs> No, I, I, I agree. It could have been fun. I actually kind of like the cases. Um, the, the, this snaps together really nice. You know, the lasers went in real clean once I drilled the holes. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I was thinking, this isn't that hard. My kids could totally put them together, you know? I just set up like a little assembly line to get their little fingers working. Uh, <laughs> no, okay, another cool thing. I didn't get to this. I wanted to make one with it. So the ESP Home, you can actually set it up. Like, you know when you buy a device, it says, oh, connect to the Wi-Fi, and then you can set it up. Like, that's how a lot of devices you buy are. And you connect to the access point that they're setting. You put in your Wi-Fi, then it goes and connects. ESP Home has that all built in. So you could solder up one of these, throw an ESP in, and just hand it to somebody. They could bring it home, magically connect it to their own Wi-Fi, and it magically connects to their own home assistant. It'd be real nice. So I, it takes me about, like, I, I timed myself on the second one I did. And it took me a full, like, 12 or 15 minutes, right, to do the full front to back, opening it up, soldering everything, cutting all the wires, fixing my mistakes and everything. I could get it down to seven minutes. And so I could, I could pump on these. If people really want one, I'll make you one. Good to. Oh, I mean, I, I would absolutely do that. I don't think I need a smart one. You know what I mean? Like, you can just bring a thermocell. Like, they're great for camping. They have ones that run on butane, like just really camping butane. Yeah, Joshua. You mentioned the difficulty with the soldering. Uh, you know, you could teach your kids to do that. That would probably go easier. The hardest part is getting them not to grab the hot part. Yeah, okay. After that, easy. Easy. <laughs> easy. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, tell me more about that. What did it mislead you on? I mean, it, 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 it'll get stuck. Like, if, you, if you're stuck on a problem and ChatGPT can't figure it out in one or two iterations, it might just be stuck too. You know, and sometimes a lot, the major value, the way to get the most out of ChatGPT is knowing how to paste a lot of context in, like documentation. And the other thing is knowing how to be like, okay, I have to take a pause and use my own brain here for a minute and, like, actually try to, like, get it in a different space, because clearly I'm trying to solve this problem wrong. And I think 4.0 sucks, honestly. Um, I didn't use any of the better ones, like um, Claude's stuff, or going back to 4, but I do think 4.0 can get kind of stuck easier. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Any last thoughts? Everybody good? Thanks, Very cool. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.